It is Saturday at Origins Game Fair and taking a little bit of a break away from the exhibit hall where we've seen all the interviews to this point taking place. But I have the great privilege and opportunity to speak with John Zinzer, the Grand Poobah of Alderac Entertainment Group, or as those of us in the new know like to call it, AEG. John, so good to see you once again. Good to see you too. You and I had an opportunity with <clears throat> Elliot Miller from VoiceofB.com back in the day, kick back, talk gaming over beers and pizza. Yep. And we have not had a chance to chat since, and this is the first time we're on camera together. So it welcome. Has been, it has been a long time, and I'm finally glad we're getting a chance to do this. Cool deal. I usually talk to Todd. So, all right. So there is loads and loads going on with AEG. Absolutely. So, and we we have a short period of time to dig into it. So we're going to jump right in. First off, Thunderstone Quest, amazing. It is awesome. Everybody is loving it. It was a fantastic Kickstarter. The champion level reward was just amazing. My friends, everybody loves it. I gave it a 9.5 out of 10 because we enjoyed it so much. I'm and work hard to get that last point five. Well, I know. I, listen, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Awesome. It is phenomenal. It is a huge box, and we're yeah, going to show you the box in a sec. And I've reviewed it on unboxings. Take a peek if you want a closer look. And I love the fact that it, it has become so much easier to introduce people into Thunderstone yep. than it had in the past. Yes. Thunderstone previously was a great game, but a little tricky to little kind crunchy, of learn. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was and a little crunchy. Gone. Yeah, I think the guys did a really good job of uh, making, I mean, it's an adventure, right? You're either in the city or you're in the dungeon, and that was always a little confusing in the original Thunderstones. And this right. one, it's There it's is a village you can clear. go to on the board. Yep. There is the dungeon on the board, and it's very, very cool because there's all these dungeon tiles. There's many of them, Yep. and that makes up the dungeon. The monsters are in those different rooms of the dungeon. Yep. I especially like how the light mechanics still, light still remains to get deeper into the dungeon, but it's not as tricky to figure out how can you get into those yes. deeper levels. Yes, absolutely. That was always um, that was always an issue for me. I was always trying to figure out what I could do with my light rather than trying to figure out how to kill the monsters. Exactly. And that has gone away in this version of the game. So, love and, it. and monsters score you victory points. They no longer go into your deck. It is a wonderful deck building game. It is. Awesome. What I especially like too is the various different quests. And if you want, while we're talking, why don't you pull the pull the uh, okay, the cube down, there. as I like to say, the there gaming cube, which clocks in. I think really this clocks in at like ten pounds or something like something that. Like fifteen more. five, fifteen five. You know. I was gonna say fifteen, and I'm like, no, nah, maybe that's a little too heavy. Few of these in while I'm sitting here, until I stay in good shape while I'm at these shows. I was gonna say it that fell heavy because I'm weak. Ugh. But this is just amazing there is a retail edition that's coming out soon but i want to talk about how a lot of folks out there are scrambling like how could i get this this is awesome but it was a kickstarter and they're all gone and i don't want to pay 300 dollars on the secondary market but there's very good news good news yeah. this is coming back to kickstarter july, july 17th. 17th i don't even need to be here yes july 17th hey Come on, having a I love having it. a live weekday show Monday through Friday. I cover all of the news. I know, know all your this stuff. stuff. You know your stuff. Yes, July seventeenth, uh, the new Kickstarter. You're going to be able to get all of the stuff from the original Kickstarter. We're also adding uh, an additional new quest uh, and uh, really well done, well thought out solo and co-op rules. Yes. And if you don't want to take the dive into the Kickstarter, which I got to be honest, you really, really should. This is a phenomenal value. Absolutely. Because the retail edition is going to come out, I believe, like Q4? Before Christmas, yeah, Q4. Okay. And my understanding is the retail edition is going to have the basic cards. It's going to have two quests. Yep. And it's going to carry an MSRP of, a, I thought I saw it, might be wrong, $79.99? About $70 to $80, yeah. Okay. I mean, there's a... This, this is the value proposition. It right? is. Like it, it, getting everything you want for Thunderstone between $100 and $140 is pretty darn good. It's phenomenal. Because if I remember correctly, this itself, the champion level was uh, $100. It was 100 bucks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, and it's great. So, folks, don't miss out. 
no reason to pay three hundred dollars. I swear, you will get your hands on this for. If uh, you want to pay three hundred dollars, you can email me directly, exactly. and we can work something out. I'm not selling my copy. You're out of luck. <laughs> Look, there's there's a hey, gentleman that here. Card's coming in. Elliot Miller looks to looks to buy a copy. So. Speaking, oh, and the additional quests, I think, are going to be $39.99. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it, well. It's going to be priced similar to any other deck builder that you would find on the retail exactly, market. Right, and right. The Kickstarter gives us the opportunity to compile all of that production into one big chain and pass the savings on yeah, to our amazing. consumers. Amazing. Yeah. Talking about awesome values, let's talk about another big box. You guys got some big boxes cooking. Yeah, thank you. And very it is much. Mystic Veil vale Conclave. Mr. Vale Conclave. So this is going to, if I understand correctly, this is going to contain the core game as well as I believe, is it four expansions? So you can um, you can carry all of the game and the expansions in this box. That's this it. is a carry box. This box actually uh, increases the number of players from four to six. There we go. So like like our big geeky box and our right, boxes in the right. past, this is a it's a it's a storage solution as well as a mini expansion for the game. Okay, and if you're not familiar with Mystic Veil, vale, if you're like the two people watching who are not familiar with this game, it is considered a card crafting game. Card crafting game. And you build your cards as you play because various sections of your cards, and they're like tarot sized cards, yep, tarot -sized cards, have transparencies. Yep. So the cards have transparencies and three slots for abilities. Um, as the game progresses, you fill those different slots with different transparent cards, making your individual cards better, um, and, but not making your deck bigger. And right. the game is played in sort of a push your luck mechanism so that you can mill through your deck as quickly as possible to get back to the cards that you've upgraded and, and play them in awesome combos. And there's also an expansion on the horizon as well. I'll give, give you just a second to pull that on out. There you go. Excellent. Uh, it is Twilight Gale, Garden. Twilight Garden. I think this is one of the greatest covers we've ever done, by the way. So um, what we'll kudos do... Kudos to the artist and our okay, I'll kind of hold this here because... Yeah. Oh, sorry. It'll be like the talking box. I know people want me to do this during the interview, but that's okay. So, yes, it is Twilight Garden, and it looks like there is one big, nasty spider that you're going to have to worry about there. Absolutely. And Mystic Veil vale has done phenomenally well for you, and it came yes. out of the blue. So, uh, it sort of came out of the blue. We, when we met, um, uh, when we met John Clare, uh, he showed us the the game that we most recently kickstarted, Edge of Darkness, um, and it is a, it is, it's got card crafting and worker placement and all sorts of cool mechanics mixed right. in together, uh, and we'd never seen the card crafting thing, and and after we'd committed to um, to Edge. He came back and said, you know, I, I have a game that uses just uses that card crafting component. Let me show that to you. And it was obvious from the first time I played it that we should do that game first because the, the, the core game, that, that, that sort of engine that runs Edge of Darkness is card crafting. And if you know how to play the card crafting, you're already past the most difficult part of that. And let's talk a little bit about Edge of Darkness, which is going to be on the horizon. We don't have anything to show you here because that was another Kickstarter that yep. you guys did that did phenomenally well. Absolutely. So Edge of Darkness is one of those games that's built for Kickstarter. I don't think uh, a company like AEG could do a game like that without, um, uh, without, without understanding how many people were interested in it. It's just hard to guess right. what kind exactly. of print run to do for a game that's that expensive. Um, Edge of Darkness is a um, uh, it is a game set in a uh, a city that is being besieged by uh, by dark creatures, and you are one of the guilds in that city. Um, your your guild is a deck of cards that you need to craft. Uh, unlike Mystic Veil, vale, those cards um, go from your hand into a shared deck, so everybody gets an opportunity to use those cards. When, um, when your opponents use those cards, they have to pay you for the right to do so, and so you get more powerful as a guild inside of the city. Oh, okay. um, there's four or five different good strategies that you can take to win the game. You can take a defensive stance. You can totally ignore the fact that the monsters are attacking the city. You can go on offense and actually take the fight to the monsters. The game comes with an amazing cube tower. It's... It, it's a beast, and, and it, it's going to be a highlight product for us, I think. 
And one, one aspect of the game that I thought was very interesting, which I always like in many games, are different avenues to victory. Absolutely. I dig that because not only does it give you a few options and not having to follow the leader on things, it also has to make you stay on your toes because it's like, Absolutely. oh my God, I can't believe I just let Elliot jump ahead of me because I wasn't paying attention to his avenue to victory. So Absolutely. I love those kind of games. Absolutely. Now let's shift gears again and go back to big, big boxes. And we're going to take a look at the bigger, geekier box for Smash Up. And I am always the first person to say that when I originally saw the first Smash Up coming out, got the news about it, and saw it, and I thought, what is, it? What is AEG thinking? I, I'm the first one to admit it. I was kind of like, I don't know. It just doesn't seem. So we go to Gen Con. Everybody's playing it. And unbeknownst to me, there was a little uh, viral marketing going on. <laughs> a little. Just a little bit. Because everywhere you turned, there were people playing Smash Up. You'd walk into the men's room, and there were people sitting there. Well, not to that extent. And that just took off. And that has just been, that is like an evergreen for you. It has been a fantastic evergreen for us. And it's fun. I was wrong. I'm the first to admit, I was completely wrong. It's a great game. So when um, when Paul came and pitched this game to me, um, I, I think he literally built the cards on the plane on the way to Gamma. It was chicken scratch on cut out pieces sure. of paper. On a napkin, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was yeah. one of those pitches, yeah, right? Sure, right? And he sat down with me and he's like, I've got this game. You take this deck and this deck and you push them together and... and and it's instant, you know, it's, it's, it's this thing. And I said, oh, it's, I get it, Paul. It's, it's instant built deck. And he says, yes, it's instant built deck. He says, I'm going to tell other vendors that. I'm going to tell other publishers. Is that okay? And I said, yeah, sure. But I like the game. I think we want to do it. I don't want you talking to other publishers yeah. about this. So he left and then came back the next day and he was a little dejected. And he's like, nobody else gets it, John. You're the only one that gets it. We have to do this game together. And I'm like, good. I'm glad they didn't get it. And so um, now I'm going to cut your percentage down because you didn't take my offer in the first place. I'm absolutely. There was some tough negotiation, tough negotiation. We took three of his samples away from his deal. He has to buy all of his samples. And and folks out there kind of laugh and they think, oh, well, you know, there, there are no more tropes or, or memes that AEG could possibly bring to smash up. And that's not true. It is not true. In fact, the next set, the one that's coming out in... Um, September, I think, is uh, is called Oops, You Did It Again, and it's got four of the most obvious tropes that we've totally missed over the course of the last five years. It's got cowboys and Egyptians and, oh, there's too many factions. I need to look at the box to remember. Cowboys, <laughs> Egyptians, Vikings, and one other faction that I can't even remember at this point. How can you possibly, in this day and age right now, not have something with Vikings in it? They're the new zombies. They are the new zombies, absolutely. I love the and 70s one. you want to play Viking out. zombies, disco zombies, it's in there. Say, I love the 70s edition that came out because I was a small kid during the 70s, so I do remember. I wasn't that old, okay? I was like a little yeah, yeah. kid, we're, all right? We're in the same ballpark. We were. So like, oh my God. Clint Eastwood. And, oh, it's just, just hysterical. Uh, let's talk about some other stuff. You've awesome. got uh, Cat Lady. Cat Lady, yes. Which, uh, which is a cute game that's done very, very well for you. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I've told the story a hundred times now, and it's it's just worth repeating. When this game was pitched to me, I said, should we really do another cat game? And my staff basically said, yes, 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 we should. Um, and I'm glad we did. It's a super simple game. You draft lines or columns of cat and food and catnip and... Um, uh, the object is to get as many cats as you can and make sure that they're all fed by the end of the game. Sounds simple, but as the game starts to progress, you start to see the, the, the deeper level of strategy in the game. Definitely enough to keep you engaged and wanting to play again. And you've got uh, Istanbul with Dice Game. Istanbul with Dice Game. Uh, designer did a great job of taking... The, the core feeling of what Istanbul was and putting it into a dice game. So it's not a, a straight copy of the Istanbul game, but when you play this game, you, you have that exact same feeling of going to the markets and collecting items and, and doing those things, which I think is what a great dice game should do. Because the reality is, at least in my opinion, uh, when something is ported over like from a, like a card game or board game into yeah. a dice game, 
I like I like the feel. I don't want the same exact game because why would I play not Absolutely play the right. other game in the first place? Absolutely right. Then you've got uh, a new, I believe it's a new standalone expansion for The Captain is Dead coming. We absolutely do. The Captain is Dead Lockdown. In the Captain is Dead Lockdown, it is assumed that uh, in the last episode, your crew was captured by the aliens that you were trying to escape from, and now you are in their alien prison ship, and you are trying to figure out a way to get out. And the captain is still still dead. dead. Yes, you'll have and to. And this, this is uh, this kind of a tongue-in-cheek. This is this is not an overly serious sort of game. It's, it's got a lot of not. nods to various classic science fiction. Yep. Absolutely. And it, and it's kind of funny. It's kind of uh, the captain, the main star of the show, gone. And now it's up to the supporting cast to actually become the real heroes. Yes. Um, the puns are supposed to fly in this game, and uh, for a game that is is light and people are joking about the joking while they're playing it it is extremely difficult to beat the captain is dead on its most basic level so it's not an easy co-op to just sort of walk through and say oh fantastic we didn't need the captain as it turns out you might have needed the captain it's not easy and and i i am not a big fan of co-op games that are just pushovers oh, where it's me like me. wow we just learned how to play this game and we you know, we aced it and sort of like those don't come back off the shelf all that often yeah i don't want them to be pushovers and i also don't want them to yeah, just sort possible. of end in an unsatisfying way right at the end of a good co-op if you've made some good decisions there should be a tension you know that, right. that, that, or that even that when you lose there. where you're like Oh man, guys, we were so, so close. close. If that hadn't, absolutely. as opposed to, oh man, ugh. again? Again, yeah, absolutely. Then you've got uh, another recent release, which is from the same designer of Mystic Veil, vale, yeah, as John well Hoyer. as uh, Edge of Darkness, and it is Space Base. Space Base. Uh, space Base. So, um, John is not the biggest fan of dice games. He is, uh, he is a little bit of a control freak. And, um, doesn't like randomness and chaos? Does not like randomness and chaos. And so, uh, I, you know, we'd get together and I'd always want to play a dice game. And he would say, I don't really love dice games, right? Too much randomness. And after the 15th or 20th time of my saying, let's play a dice game, he came back to me with Space Space. He said, and, I'll tell you what, I'll design a dice game I actually like myself. That's exactly Isn't what he did. Some, a lot of some of the best games are made. Uh, it's like, gosh. I want to. I, I don't like this sort of game, but I'm going to make a sort of game like that genre that I like, that I uh, want to play. I, I mean, listen. I you know, as soon as I realized that I could get John to make a game just by giving him a hard time, I, I'm looking for the next thing that he doesn't like, and I'm just going to start asking him to play that until right. he can, until he gives me another space base. And this is out. This is out right now. This is out. This actually came out in February. It has done. Um, uh, better than we could could have hoped on on release. It's getting uh, fantastic reviews, fantastic buzz. Um, it uh, uh, we actually uh, had to hold back copies from a very big print run so that we would have some copies at Gen Con this year, uh, and we've got another print run coming in for Christmas. Um, you know, if you like um, if you like dice chucking, engine building games that. Um, that, that, that keep you engaged on every roll of the dice, this is the game for you. And my understanding, too, is there's very little downtime when it's not your turn because everyone else involved in the game actually gets to do things when it's someone else's turn. You're basically building two engines. You're building an engine that you get to pop while you roll the dice, and then you're building a secondary engine that works when everybody else rolls the dice. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very magical. There's not enough time to get up and use the restroom or go sure, get coffee. Right. So. Sure, right. Then uh, you have an upcoming release, which you do have here to take a look at, and it is War Chest. War Chest. And I get a lot of war gamers, and uh, a lot of war gamers of various different stripes. People new to the hobby, people yep. who have been around for a long time with the old Avalon Hill and things like that. And this is probably something that many of them will want to take a peek at because it is a bit lighter. It's a t- like an abstract tactical war game. Abstract, that's a pretty good way of putting it, actually. It's still, um, it's a two or four player, basically board war game where you're doing area control with units. Um, each of the units have has its own um, a specific way that it can attack other units and its own specific way that it can move on the board. Um, a bit chess-like, A right? bit chess-like, yeah, absolutely. Um, the rules here, and the rules aren't 
super long. Nope, nope. Very easy to, to play. Um, the, the number of things that you can do are, are, are limited. It's a bag building game. So you start the, the, the game with a certain number of copies of the tokens that you, the, uh, from the units you start with in the bag. And then over the course of the game, you decide which of your units you want to add to the bag. Um, units get on the board. They can either, um, uh, you can either send a new unit out, you can bolster a unit that's in play, or you can discard one of the tokens that you've drawn to activate a unit on the board. So um, it's, it's one of those games that if you're the type of guy that likes to look two and three and four turns into right, the future, plan ahead. you might be good at this game. And it's so. funny, Elliot Miller and I were just talking last night that we're starting to see this just real shift away from games that allow you to sit back and construct a strategy. Right. They're like, okay, three turns down the line where everything seems to be more just reactionary. What do I have right in front of me right this moment? Right. And I love games because I'm old school. I, I come from the old school Avalon Hill SBI kind of kind of school of games where Yeah. And I'll I'll be the first to admit, you don't you can't see it, but these are not just chintzy little plastic pieces here. These these have half these first are class, almost like first class poker chips. I was gonna say, they're like poker chips. Uh, if anybody out there has a Lovecraft or uh, Lovecraft letter. There you go, yeah, absolutely. It's the same, same kind quality. of thing. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, this is this is one of those types of games that I wish I was good at, right? Like I, I do not see three turns into the okay. future, but um, but I have watched my staff um, who love this game, um, and it is one of those games that I, you know, when when they have time to play it, I'm constantly having to say, hey guys, that game's done. We have to right. like Wrap stop up, stop guys. stop playing War Chest. We've got we've got other games to work on here, so. Um, that's always a good sign. And I believe, uh, is this one that you're going to have some copies at Gen Con? We are air freighting some copies to Gen Con. So and when we'll, is retail release? Uh, you know, actually the boat's going to be arriving. It's supposed to arrive on the 2nd of August. So our expectation would be um, late August, early September at the latest. Very cool. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, I believe there's something we're leaving out. Now, are we? Was, was this no, everything? this was everything. I could have swore there was one last title that had slipped my mind. Is there anything in the pipeline that you feel comfortable revealing to the audience? Sure. Um, yeah, we've got a uh, we've got a, a, a great new game called uh, uh, Scorpius Freighter from the designer David Short. It is a um, sounds like a sci-fi. It is a sci-fi um, Euro game, probably the closest thing to a true Euro we've ever made. Um, it is a, uh, you are a space smuggler and you have a spaceship and um, you're going to be adding tiles to your spaceship to create sort of an internal engine that actually acts as your engine in the game. And then you'll be using that engine or activating that engine by exploring three different um, uh, planets in the Scorpius system. And those planets are actually rondelles and as you move ships around them it allows you to determine what you're doing with your ship. And when's that uh, expected? That'll be at Essen. That'll be at Essen. That's our big. That's our big Essen release. So you sort of heard it, heard it here first. I've put my staff on the spot. We will have Scorpius Freighter at Essen. David Short, buy your ticket. Or heads will roll. There's Any no final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience, John? No, I. Uh, you know, I. I've actually had a great time at Origins this year. I camped out at this table at the big bar on two, and everybody's come to me. Um, and we've gotten to sit down, so that's yeah, that's a bonus for us doing interviews. I, I mean, usually when I do one of these interviews, somebody buys me a drink, but you know, you it's, see that's weird because as the press, we're used to other people buying us drinks to bring us over. I don't want your readers to you think that there's that. any impropriety. Viewers, we're asked viewers. I apologize, viewers and readers too. No, no money has changed hands yes, here. We are not bribing anyone with drinks right. to do this interview. This is not San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> oh shoot. Well, right. John, I do want to point out. I always love having a chance to talk to anyone from AEG because AEG was one of the first companies that actually got on board with the gaming gang, saw the potential that, you know, we weren't just a bunch of knuckleheads or anything like that. And I have found over the years, I like AEG because you have some of the nicest 
most fun people working for your company? That is a great compliment. At the end of the day, that is really what's most important. If you're having fun making games, you will likely make fun games. I would hope. John, thank you so much. You Enjoy much. the rest of the show. Fun. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.